Yep. Yeah. Can I load up this with you? Excellent. Yeah, it's probably Whatever you're comfortable with. I guess yeah. I usually use Firefox. Oh, yeah. Cool. So I can just hook my computer right now. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Cool. So we're going to set it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'll do my own. I'll have just a five minute or one minute. So you guys are comfortable? Yeah. Long, comfortable. Excuse me. Yeah. yeah. There's been a bit yeah. of problems with people. It's like, it's a little bit too much. No, no, it's so, <laughs> it's totally yeah. fine to be a two yeah. minute or two over. Yeah. yeah. But as long as it's, it's all three. The nature of process. Yeah. As long as all three gets to go. The, yeah, that's, that's the important part. And maybe one question. Yeah, that, that's, that's my goal. Got it. Really kind of, yeah. Well, I didn't really time myself, but I mean, I can skip things, so um, I, you know. What I get to, I get to. Um, and how about sound? Are we able to put sound yeah. up too? Because I wanted to show a clip of the game. Let's see. Scrolling it through there. This would be a sound board. Yeah, there's an audio in. Okay, there's an audio in. Do we have a cable or? No, that we do not have. Um, what is it? The, H the HMI shouldn't the HMI just pick it up? Oh, the yeah. HMI pick it up? It does usually, but yeah. it depends on their system, I guess. Sure. Let's see. But is it going to? But is it going to pick it up with an Apple? Oh, yeah. that's the thing. I don't know. So I don't know. Does so the Apple Mini? Does that do sound too? I think it just does. Yeah. Awesome. You know what? You know what I mean? Yeah, I know exactly. <laughs> um, so we would need just like a. We would just need a. Is it possible to just ask one of the... Hey, Wonderful. It's exactly what we need right now. <laughs> <laughs> What's up? Do you have any audio in that could have lost you? Um, there should be. Okay. Besides HMI. Yeah. Well, I think with the map, when you when you leave the, the, the out, I don't know if it picks up sound or not. Um, you should be able to do that setting. That's what I usually do. Cool. Feel free. Uh, on the phone? Have it. Uh, on mine. Okay. Better because I'm going to be doing it on I also, I also okay. Oh, well, perfect. Awesome. And hopefully, so this, this would definitely be the easiest problem. way for this to work. Okay. Uh, um, Maybe. So, like, right there. I'll put... Oh. Does that work? Um, do we have sound? Yeah. Oh. Ooh, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> that works. Right, so that works. So just, uh, okay. Go so yourself. you're just plugged in right now to oh, the HMI. Oh, I see. So you have to load it on this. Yeah. Will it will it work if I use uh, the adapter? It should. Um, it should still be an output. It'll that still be an HDM output. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that one's low right now. Um, yeah, that. Because you're you're plugged HDMI directly, right? Directly, right? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah, because I don't, I, I, w I don't have an HDMI on my MacBook, so as long as this actually does sound output as well, then um, we'll be fine. I think that. I remember being surprised by that working recently in yeah, these rooms, but uh, <laughs> let me know if it doesn't, and I can run and get a new cable. Would you mind if I tested it real quick and no. just? That's probably the better idea. Yeah. So let's test it now. Yeah. yeah. In terms of order, just go off the schedule. Sure. I'll make sure to take 45 minutes so you guys don't get sick. Are we going to do the Q&A as a group? Yeah. Okay, cool. Everyone's comfortable with that. We did my favorite part. Yeah. It's out there. I'm really not anxious. I'm not really anxious. I'm not really anxious. But, uh, <laughs> some food to provide the yeah. conversation. Q&A is where I'm at. Um... And then that's it. Right? Yeah. Work. And then just control the uh, audio on the panel. Control the. Um, no, I, on the uh, on the little one over there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I should. Yeah, I should have a um, okay. um, volume. Is there a way of controlling the volume? Where, where, where it's just. I? It's just on there. On the okay. Panel. And we turned it down already. Yes. I don't so want to blow anyone's head up. Okay. Alright, great. Um, cool. Let me know if during it you guys know, need anything I'll sure. in the corner. I'm going to test the clip real quick. Sure, it works. It might be. Me, the person who's presenting, can be like here. Yeah. And then we all can sit over there because otherwise our breathing might pick up. Yeah. On that. Oh, okay. It'll be an interesting Twitch stream if that's what we want. Hmm. No sound? Oh, no, hold on. It's, uh... Yeah, no sound. How's that not working? 
Doesn't sound like it. Doesn't. Okay, um. Let me go see if I can find an auxiliary. Yeah, yeah I mean, possibly. I mean, unless I'm doing something wrong here. Um, I don't know what you would. It's on the HDMI. Um, yeah, gosh, I don't know. The audio should be coming over there. Okay. Well, let's see what I can do cable wise. Okay. Well, the good news is, Sean, we had to schedule for third, so. Right. So that should be enough time to get an audio jack. Cool. Yeah, I'm sure. Audio out. It's just like a headphone jack out, and there's a jack over there for that. So if I just yeah, let me just let me just double check and make sure this is not it's not new. I don't have a watch, so I won't be on my phone. But I'll be using my phone as a watch. Actually, be rude. I'm I'm okay. Are you? Yeah. Okay. Uh, are you the right one now? Yes. Where, what, what is the page? What are we plugging in? HDMI? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 You seem to have something. Yeah. Hold on, now I hear something. I hear something. Maybe, maybe we turned it too low. Oh, yeah. all right. Ta -da! Bingo. Oh! Okay. Save the day. Enjoy. All right. It's okay. So now let me just double check with the, the video clip in the presentation. I get the prices right to work. But now let's see if I can get my presentation. Oh, I can just press on the prices right. Um, all right. Video. I've for years You should to like his <laughs> so, you know, it could be, well, it could be the clip, which is fine. I can just jump over to YouTube for it. Yes, let me, let me double check. Uh, YouTube. Are you watching the clip of when the contestant won the car by accident? Uh, yes. <laughs> By accident? Yeah. The, the, uh, what are they called? It's like the Anna White of Price is Right uh, revealed the winning one by accident. So the contestant was like, I'll take that one. <laughs> We're getting sound. Yeah, so it must, it must just be whatever the clip I have for some reason being embedded. Um, which is really weird because I tested it yesterday, but who, who knows? It doesn't really matter. I think just exit out of the PowerPoint and go to YouTube yeah. on the screen. It's totally fine. Yeah. And just so you know, that clock is running a little early. Yes. We started at 3.30, right? Or do we... Uh, no, you started at 3.00. Yeah. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, I'm going to set my same I think you do that email, you type 3.30. We're all good. Okay. Sorry. 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 I'd probably say my name. My name is Brian McKernan. Uh, I'm a co-organizer at different games. I'm also a postdoc up at SUNY Albany. Uh, but it's not about me right now. Uh, it's about these three amazing panelists. So first, we have uh, Grayson Earl, who's a new media artist based in Brooklyn. Uh, Grayson's work is uh, usage of video games to explore different forms of cultural critique. Uh, Grayson's also a member of the Illuminator Art Collective. Uh, and Grayson teaches at Hunter College and Drew College. Uh, today, Grayson will be talking about how video games can help formulate powerful cultural critiques. Uh, and by staging the player as I love as far as an agent of subversive activity. Hey. How y'all doing? Cool. Good to see you. Um, uh, so first I want to talk about this art collective that I'm involved in and one of our 
new members is actually sitting here, Todd Anderson. <laughs> um, and uh, basically what we do is uh, we, we were born out of the context of Occupy Wall Street. We own collectively this cargo van here that we've retrofitted to house a uh, projector, a very powerful projector, um, 12,000 lumens. And we stage political interventions in and around New York City. We've been to the West Coast, all around the Northeast as well, and then Quebec, which is where this photo was taken. Um, and recently we've got into doing a little bit of uh, games, uh, guerrilla projecting games into public spaces. And the first one that I want to talk about is Tax Evaders, which was a collaboration with Molly Industria. Uh, some of you may be familiar with their work. They did the McDonald's game every day the same day and a number of other really great cultural critique style games. Um, I wish I can show, so I have a cough drop in my mouth. Um, so I'm going to show a video of what that looks like. There's this. Well, there's like a really great soundtrack that I didn't record for this. Um, but anyway, you, you sort of, as the player, you control this crowd and you're meant to sort of like people power, shoot down these uh, corporations that dodge taxes, paying their taxes in a number of different ways through like loopholes, hiring fancy lawyers and all this stuff. And the result of that is of course like essentially uh, indirectly enforcing austerity on um, nations around the, around the globe. And here you can see when you destroy Wells Fargo, Citibank or General Electric, the money gets dumped back into these public institutions. Um, and um, it's available online at taxevaders.net. And I should also mention Gone Galan uh, organized this whole project between the Illuminator and Mali Industria. Um, and at the end, you sort of like defeat this big alien. It's really, really a fun game. And so what we did was made this uh, playable in public space um, and projected it onto some of these places that were implicated in what we were talking about, like Citibank, um, Chase Bank, and um, uh, I thought I had a good... Uh, well, anyway, it's, yeah, it's playable via Wii controller. Um, and then we did a collaboration with the NYCLU, the New York Civil Liberties Union, when they were doing a campaign to sort of fix public defense, because the problem there is that um, public defenders are totally overworked, and because of that, you, uh, you, you aren't entitled to the same sort of um, you know, legal defense that you would be if you had money to hire a private attorney, right? And so there's this major imbalance in the way that people uh, are treated in our legal system. Um, and that campaign was actually successful, um, which is really nice to be a part of. Um, and this is a, a video of what, what it looked like. And we projected this um, in Albany, but I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so with the Wii controller, you sort of spin this wheel like you would um, a normal wheel, and then it lands on one of these slices, and it's uh, a real story about a New Yorker. So this one is, uh, you're accused of stealing $20, your lawyer doesn't show up to court, so you, your bail is set at $2,500, you can't afford it, so you're stuck in jail for months over $20. Uh, and this was a true story about a New Yorker, um, and all of these uh, slices have such a story. Um, and we projected this onto the architecture of Albany. This is like the infamous uh, egg dome. I don't know if anyone does this. I was totally uh -huh. unfamiliar. Um, landscape. Yeah, totally weird. We later projected Cuomo, we have egg expectations for justice. It's a nice <laughs> pun that we worked with too. But um, yeah, so we, we projected this around Albany and invited people to play it. And a number of those people were like uh, government workers. Um, so it's interesting to like directly confront them with this thing. Um, what do I got for next? And uh, actually, before I go to that, um, and then uh, some of my own work um, uh, has been centered around a lot of the stuff that's been going on with the NSA. And this stuff doesn't take place in public space per se, but on the internet, which is like its own sort of site of contestation, right? Um, so after um, Edward Snowden's revelation sort of came out, there was all this stuff about, um, you know, the government was tracking our online movements. And so I did some research on this and found that there had been a Freedom of Information Act request that gleaned a list of 750 words and phrases that are used to track uh, our searches, our social media conversations and all this stuff, um, used to police us essentially. And so I thought that, that would be an interesting uh, creative context for one, but also I was trying to think about how we might directly uh, sort of jam or throw a monkey wrench uh, into this system. And so. <laughs> 
I came up with the NSA haiku generator, <laughs> and what it does is it takes that list and generates haiku <laughs> out of those words. Um, and they're like totally random, so a lot of the times there's, it's like very nonsensical, but um, some, this one's not bad. Blowpipe, Goodwin Cloud, Glock, Authorities, Niche Clone, Hate, Homeland Defense. We do hate Homeland Defense. Um, evaluation, Crypto, Anarchy, Breach, Plot, Cartel, Nuclear. And so you're meant to then uh, share these things, and you can see there's like, you can email it to a friend, you can Facebook it, you can tweet it, you can tweet it at Barack Obama. Uh, so that's actually, we're going to go ahead and do that. Um, yeah. And, uh, and so <laughs> what happened was it eventually got like a little bit of a, it had its, its sort of 15 minutes and there were, you know, thousands of people sharing these haiku back and forth over the internet. And so it served to oversaturate the internet with these sensitive terms and um, therefore sort of make the surveillance apparatus a little less useful for them. Um, and so this one isn't strictly a game, uh, but it did uh, sort of lead into this next thing that I'll show you. And I, I, my hope is that we can play this together. Um, how am I doing on time? Good? Great. Okay, cool. Um, so this game is it's nsagame.net. The other one is nsahaiku.net. Uh, it's called Terrorist Threat or Harmless Phrase. So using the same list of words, um, I should like, there we go, yeah. Um, I made this game where, as you can see, there's two words on the screen. So one of these words is on the NSA's watch list, and one of them is not. So the goal of this game is to guess which one is not on that list. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to, like, just take, like, you know, very, I'm going to measure by volume what you guys think. So Minesweeper or Hurricane, which one's not on the list? Hurricane. Minesweeper. Okay. Uh, physics or Coast Guard? Physics. Terror, tuberculosis, or Native American? Terror, tuberculosis. <laughs> okay, so that one actually is on the list. <laughs> so now you can see that there's like this, this health bar. Kind of <laughs> <laughs> uh, disaster management or tea party? Tea party. Tea party. <laughs> um, storm or prism? Storm. Prism. Well, I don't know which storm. one. Storm. 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 I don't know. Oh, damn. Oh, wow. I want you guys to lose. Uh, oh. Hezbollah or molecular biology? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you think? Molecular biology. Okay. Damn it. Uh, Mount Rushmore or Abe? Aid. 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 They don't provide it. Oh. Oh. Uh, quarantine or Deep South? Oh, shit. <laughs> Shadow boxing or Mexico? Mexico. Mexico. Ooh. Ooh. Resistant or gunpowder? Resistant. Shootout. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Shootout or missing nukes? <laughs> Social <laughs> media. Nigerian prince. Nigerian prince. They never lose that. That's why. Secret service or Banksy? Secret, Secret service. Banksy. Ooh, okay. oh. So we lost, and so what it does is it runs a Google search for the words that tricked you, <laughs> <laughs> implicating you in the system, and you become like one of the surveilled. And the number one result is the list of words. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> and uh, if you if you if you win, which uh, I guess, well, I won't go through that again. But if you win, and you go ten rounds. We were on the last round together. We almost made it. Um, then you get to add your own word, and it gets entered into this sort of learning algorithm where uh, the words that trick you more often like become more visible at, or present at higher levels of play, so the game becomes more difficult as more people use it and all this stuff. Um, and then finally, uh, I'm also interested in using games to engage in critique of the fine arts world, which I find really interesting, um, especially the sort of economics of that world. And so this back up. Um, I'm not sure how many uh, people are familiar with Ai Weiwei. He's a Chinese artist, and um, this is one of his most famous works, uh, where it's a triptych um, of him dropping a Han Dynasty urn, like a thousand-year-old Chinese urn, and it's supposed to be a dialogue about the, the role of destruction in art and culture. Um, and he's doing this, of course, like as a very subversive, sort of known subversive creative person within uh, uh, China. And so uh, fast forward to very recently, and his work was at the uh, Museum of Modern Art or some museum in, in Miami. Mm -hmm. And uh, Max uh, Caminero, I think his name was, mm -hmm. uh, walked into the museum, 
right in front of the triptych and dropped one of I's urns, one of Iowa's urns, um, as a sort of, he, well, he had his own reasons, but um, what happened was that he was quickly arrested, the security guards told all the press that the urn was worth a million dollars, he destroyed a million dollars for the property, and then Ai Weiwei and his team came out and said that this guy had, thank you, had no right to do this because he didn't own that vase. It wasn't his to break. And of course, like, to me, it was very strange to hear that because it's like, okay, here's sort of China making that exact same claim about Ai Weiwei, that he, like, had no right, even though he was Chinese, there was sort of, like, this intellectual regime that told him that he didn't own that property, didn't have the right to destroy it. And here we have the same sort of thing happening where there's this intellectual regime, which is Ai Weiwei's, art career, telling this guy, like, no, you can't destroy this thing. Um, and then there's also the valuation of that thing, which I found really interesting. So I created a, an online game called Ai Wei Whoops, and <laughs> you, you get to drop uh, as many Ai Wei Wei urns as you want, um, and uh, basically rack up uh, property damage, and then you can, like, um, so, <laughs> A little bit of lag. You can uh, send out your score online and all this stuff, and um, sort of engage in uh, a debate about the the value of fine art and the uh, the role of destruction, and how that becomes a little bit more uh, complicated and interesting when you think about it in terms of digital reproduction and how easy it is to smash sort of infinite urns online. And uh, I would love to hear I's uh, response to this, but. Uh, I've tweeted at him several times. And yes, thank you. Um, but uh, that's all I got, so thank you very much for listening. Can we ask questions now? We'll do questions at the end. Okay. So write them down and actually start out. Great, so next we have Kimberly McLeod. Uh, Kimberly is a PhD candidate in theater and performance studies at York University. Uh, Kimberly's station investigates ways performance works with new media forms to facilitate political engagement. Uh, Kimberly has had work published in Canadian Theater Review and Theater Research in Canada. And today Kimberly will be talking about two performance interventions in video games uh, and what that can tell us about activism in gaming spaces. Thank you. Okay, so in 2010, um, prankster artists Ava and Franco Mattes developed a performance intervention using the first-person shooter game Counter-Strike. In the performance, which they called Freedom, Ava entered the game, and instead of participating in the game's narrative and killing opposing players, she used the on-screen um, on messaging system to implore other players not to kill her. As she typed, she was constantly shot and then respawned in another in-game location. For each iteration, her language varied, though it usually involved her explaining that she is a performance artist making art on the site. At the same time um, that Mattis was infiltrating Counter-Strike, another artist, Joseph Delap, was working on his own artistic intervention into a war game. In March 2006, he began a durational intervention into the American military's recruitment game, America's Army. Um, according to the game's opening tagline, the player's objective is to, quote, empower yourself, defend freedom. Um, in what Delap describes as a game-based performative intervention, he turned the tables on what empowerment might mean and refused to engage in combat. Instead, he used the game's texting system and over several years typed the name, age, service branch, and date of death of every American military member killed in the conflict in Iraq. So while the content of Mattes' and Delap's texts differ, their interventions align through their refusal to engage in combat. In straying from the normative path, the artists disrupt the gameplay, leading to re reactions from other players, ranging from frustration to, aggressive, to aggression to empathy. So today I want to address how Dead in Iraq and Freedom break with the enacted routine of these spaces and challenge players to think through what their violent virtual actions might mean. The performances infuse difference into game spaces that celebrate a militarized, violent form of masculinity. At the same time, these ruptures are limited by the centrality of the single artists, as well as aspects of each of the artist's scores. Um, as they situate the actions of the players at the core of their work, Freedom and Dead in Iraq relate to ongoing debates about art's social turn, 
So Nicholas Buriaud's concept of relational art provides a starting point for considering how social performances engage participants. Buriaud argues that relational art allows for connections beyond an art object through a facilitation of interhuman relations. By placing interrelations between individuals at the forefront, relational art ideally opens up questions about how we engage with each other on a daily basis. So both um, the Mattises and Delap use war games to engage in social art. The other players' reactions are at the core of the performance and what that is. Um, while a few players are interested in what the artists have to say, most really get frustrated with the artists, um, and many of their own teammates and the other people kill them constantly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so this aggression reveals how relational art does not always build consensus. So this is a topic that's been addressed um, most notably by Claire Bishop um, in response to Boryad's theory. So Bishop contends that um, Boryad's understanding of relationality ignores that antagonism is key to any functioning democratic system. Um, and she warns that erasing difference can be unproductive as dissent and d disagreement are silenced. So I find her comments useful for considering the effects of these performance interventions as they destabilize, assu destabilize assumed relations between gamers and frequently provoke, provoke very aggressive reactions. Um, and this is from Freedom. She's just getting murdered. <laughs> Um, when looking at artistic interventions in digital spaces, I think it's important to acknowledge um, the context provided by each of these game worlds as well. So the structures of these networked war games encourage players to kill either other players, like in Counter-Strike, or non-playable characters, like in America's Army. Um, however, there are ways players can intervene into this dominant narrative. So Ian Bogos compares games to Michel de Soto's discussion of urban space and the practice of everyday life. Bogust argues that users can follow de Certo's models online by performing actions that respond to the internet's increasing private and commercial concerns. So while these are both ephemeral interventions that rely on real-time engagements of the artists in the gaming space, um, <coughs> the fleeting but pointed performances align to de Certo's practice of everyday life through their tactical agency. So as opposed to strategic power, these tactics function from outside power structures. Delap and Mattis come from outside of any existing in-group in these game spaces, and they resist the set of rules put in place by corporate and military game makers. So their outsiderness <coughs> is super blatant um, when other players accuse them of not knowing how to play. Um, both are accused of being a noob. And in one iteration of Freedom, um, another player constantly asks Mattis, um, quote, what the fuck are you doing just standing? And then tells the other players, quote, he doesn't know what he's fucking doing. Um, so Delap observes that this type of war game is, and this is a quote, participatory yet highly prescribed. Um, and he says his act escapes the cycle of repeated violence through his outsider or non-participatory subversion. So the same could be said of freedom. Um, because in her performance, she stops moving and enc encourages other players to not participate by not shooting her. So, of course, this non-participation is still an act of participation, but it's a form of participation that refuses to place action first and privileges slowness and nonviolent modes of being. Um, Delap and Mattis may not be participating in aggressive actions, but they participate just by being in the space. Um, and offering a different perspective, even if it's just for a moment we're killed. So this follows Mike Pearson's definition of site-specific performance as rendering a familiar, familiar place unfamiliar. So player reactions um, reveal the effectiveness of this rupturing of the space. So in particular, they're both told that they don't belong all the time. So this statement reveals the space has been altered in a way that makes people who regularly use it feel uncomfortable and out of place. So I have an example of this from Freedom. <laughs> if you're just an artist, then go play in paint. Don't play kind of That's what you're going to do. Hit escape and hit disconnect from game. Because you're just an artist. You don't want to be in this game. It's all about killing people. Go have fun in pain. <laughs> 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 
Um, players in Dead and Iraq make similar kind of comments. Um, I'm not showing any Dead, Dead and Iraq, not because it's not great, but because it's only texting and it's really hard to see. Um, freedom is different because you can hear it. Um, but in Dead and Iraq, people tell Delap that he should protest and memorialize in a more expected setting. So one player tells him, quote, do that somewhere else or have DC make a memorial. So these divergences from the norm connect to the idea of a performance of failure. So Sarah Jane Bales argues that performances of failure exist as a form of difference and are full of potential for, for as tactics for subver subverting dominant structures and beliefs. Um, she claims, quote, in its status as a wrongdoing, a failed objective establishes an aperture, an opening onto several and often many other ways of doing that counter the authority of a singular or correct outcome. So in Dead in Iraq and Freedom, this aperture led to mixed reactions. Many of the other players attacked Delap and Matiz for not sticking to the prescribed script. Um, while some of the players get aggressive, as we've seen, the most common responses are actually um, confusion and frustration. They both constantly get asked why they are doing their interventions, which reveals the extent to which their actions throw off the other players and alter the gaming space for them. The artist's failure to act in expected ways also aligns their work with Judith Halberstam's concept of the queer art of failure, which favors passivity over agency, radical negativity over positivity, antisociality over sociality. So like Bales, Halberstam situates failure as a means to challenge the drive to be successful in contemporary society, quote, a way of refusing to acquiesce to dominant logics of power and disciplines and as a form of critique. So she, uh, Halberstam looks at failure's political potential through its queerness as an alternate mode of being in response to normalized structures and routines. <coughs> While both of their scores are fairly open, Delap and Mattis's performances challenge normative behaviors within spaces that celebra celebrate this militarized, violent form of masculinity. Um, this masculinity masculinity, particularly in America's army, is tied to nationalistic sentiments and the nece necessary destruction of those who have different ways of being. <coughs> the reactions of other players connect Delap and Mattis to an unsettling, potentially productive queerness that disrupts game structures. Players reveal their discomfort with the artist's work by alternately accusing them of being female, queer, or, and terrorists. Um, so there are no female avatars. Um, as options in either game. Um, so both have male avatars, and they only type. Neither use um, any of the record um, microphone <coughs> devices. Um, so players can't actually assume anything about their gender based on visual or vocal cues. Um, instead, they actually generally assume that they are male throughout the game, and both are called he constantly. Yet, the players also use derogatory sexist slurs to attack the players for their femininity femininity and queerness. So players call Delap a cunt and a bitch. They also imply that he has sexual desires towards the mostly male names that he writes. One player asks Delap if they were the names of men he had asked out, while others claim, quote, they are his rape victims and that he has a, quote, dead man fetish. Um, he's also accused of being Ahmed, um, which I believe is a reference to the puppet Ahmed the Dead Terrorist from the comedian Jeff <coughs> Dunham's television show. Um, Dead and Rack and Freedom's performances of failure highlight how central unrestrained violence is in these gaming spaces. Their slow and passive interventions question this instinct within gaming and in society more generally. Delap sees his intervention as pointing to the real consequences of war, a notion embedded within the game's function as a training tool. Unlike Mattis, Delap is blatant about the pointed social critique at the heart of his intervention. As it took place for the duration of the Iraq War, Delap's project had a dual pronged aim of memorializing the dead and protesting American involvement in the conflict. In interviews and in his own writing about the project, Delap is explicit, explicit about these two goals and calls his actions a, quote, cautionary gesture. By emphasizing the real-world cost of the war, Delap connects the military back game to on-ground fighting. However, his use of actual soldiers' names has led to critiques of the work. Uh, Lee Hutchinson's brother, Ray Joseph Hutchinson, was killed in action on December 7, 2003. Upon reading about Delap's project, Hutchinson emailed the artist and requested he not use his brother's name. Delap had already typed the name at this point, though. 
Uh, he did respond to Hutchinson and said that he'd already used it and then shared some of his motivations surrounding the project. Um, and after that, the two actually appeared together on NPR on a radio broadcast to debate whether Dulab had the right to use these fa fallen soldiers' names for his anti-war protest. Um, Hutchinson very passionately <coughs> argues that Dulab's work is too open-ended. He believes that his brother would not have approved of his name being used in this decontextualized way. So this critique of the openness of Dulap's action, action could actually also apply to freedom. Um, both are super open uh, scores with sort of vague statements. I mean, it's part of what makes them relational. They offer a framework for interaction, but they don't dictate what the other players should or have to do. Um, Hutchinson's description of Dead in Iraq reveals a discomfort with the indeterminate nature of this relational art, particularly when it is conceived in relation to real-world events, such as soldiers' deaths. Um, what his opposition to the piece misses, however, is the way in which Delap also forecloses certain relations with his score. Both projects are very open-ended, yet it doesn't preclude the artist's sociopolitical aims. Um, they both work from a space of oppositionality and position the artist as the center of the intervention through their refusal to answer any other's questions. They don't use the microphone. They don't answer back by typing. Um, Delap's oppositional approach sits in the protest half of his memorial slash protest formulation. In interviews, he claims that he considers the success of Dead in Iraq as tied to negative reactions from other players. In particular, Delap finds he is most, quote, successful when players get annoyed at him to the point that they vote him out of the game, they kick <coughs> him out. He claims that at this moment, quote, the narrative of the, ga the game has been subverted. The intended audience has been reached. By focusing on opposition, Delap overlooks the messiness of his own work in which negative reactions are the norm but not the only type of response. Um, in both of the interventions, a number of players come to the artist's defense, an act that complicates Delap's formulation of anger equaling success. The instinct to rebel against the implied rules of the game space is not limited to the artist doing that. Some players jump on board with their projects, which challenges any assumption that war game players are ho a homogenous, presumably pro-violence, anti-intellectual group. Um, in Freedom, one player takes it upon himself to try to understand Mattis's intentions. He implores the other players not to shoot Ava while he asks her questions and tries to protect her. Um, and I have a quick example of this. What's an RP? One second. Don't kill him. Don't kill my knees. Oh, What's your bro? I don't know. Why does it say that? There's one with seven knives. Thank you, someone. Goddamn. What do you want? What is wrong with this guy? Really? You make him hard for Don't kill me. Don't kill me. No, no, here. Um, can I tell you something? Tell me how much help he has, please. Don't kill this guy. Tell me I got to drop the nade on him. Tell me how much help he has. Tell me how much help. Oh my gosh, you ruined it! You just ruined me! I'm out of here, y'all. Tell me how much help he made. But okay. Um, so you could hear him say, "Oh my God, you ruined it," because he was trying to protect. Um, Mattas. And Delap had a similar experience when two players um, protected him in a similar way. And other players came to Delap's defense when he was attacked, telling players to, quote, just leave him alone, and another time saying, what's wrong with what he's doing? So the ambiguity of the performances allow for these slippages, which complicate this unified picture of what a typical war game player is like. So with a more open score and no clear anti-war statements, on the surface, freedom seems less politically engaged than dead in Iraq. However, while Ava and Franco state they do, they do not actively seek out social change, their lack of a clearly articulated political goal does not necessarily negate uh, the political potential of their piece. Perception can be upset by what is not or fails to be signified. In social art, this kind of disruption can be unpredictable yet pointed. Uh, in Freedom, an example of such a disruption occurs when Mattis types the question, 
what are we fighting for? And a voice responds with freedom just before she's shot dead. Uh, through such questions, Mattis asks player to consider the, players to consider their choices, to be in the game, to kill other players, rather than just playing the way they always have. She actually states that she and Franco attempt, quote, to make art projects outside of traditional art spaces and for an audience of not typical art goers. So video game players fall under this description a lot of the time, and whether they choose to hear her pleas or not, Mattis's presence disrupts their space and forces them to engage, even if this engagement is a refusal to listen. Um, both interventions, regardless of these political aims, do rely on the work of a solo artist who is at the center of the performance score. Their interjections prompt their audiences to think about the space, but they do not provide a clear and dialogical means of participation. Delap's assumptions about the types of players on the American Army site also suggests an uncompromising approach to a space the artist finds problematic. While players have the choice of whether or not to kill these artists, uh, Delap and Mattis's refusal to answer their questions or enter into a dialogue directed by the participants closes off some of the work's scope. Yet Dead in Iraq and Freedom deviate from aggressive forms of oppositionality through their embrace of failure, which is marked by a passivity rather than aggression. They both leave their works open-ended, letting their failure to behave as expected shape the responses of other players. Their approach reveals a potential for gaming spaces as sites of protest, as sites in which to engage with these presumably not typical art goers and offer a detour from the norm. Thank you. Finally, we have Sean Fiber. Sean is a history and cultural studies teacher at Q4 School in Forest Hills, New York. Uh, Sean received his PhD from Northwestern in 2010, and I forgot to ask what you received your PhD in? Uh, modern European history. Modern European history, excellent. That seems very fitting, given <laughs> today. Uh, Sean's research focused primarily on the relation between art and politics in the former Czechoslovakia and current Czech Republic. Uh, Sean is also the project advisor, among many other things, sorry, uh, of Czechoslovakia 3889, a series of serious games in contemporary history that you could actually play out in the arcade, and I'm looking forward to later today. Uh, today, Sean will be talking about uh, how Czech historical memory and being presented through Czechoslovakia 3889 uh, can give us insight into how academics and researchers uh, can use digital media and the new affordances of digital media uh, to help teach about complex historical events. Good. Thank you. Um, great introduction. Um, so yeah, I'm a little bit different. We each of us, I think, have a little bit different of a background. Mine is more from the history, academic side of things. I'm not a game uh, designer. Um, I'm I've been acting as a project advisor uh, on this game, Czechoslovakia 3889, um, and uh, I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of the game. Uh, maybe show you the clip that's available on YouTube. It is available, as we already said, out outside to play, um, <clears throat> and then uh, spend a little time at the end, uh, hopefully enough time, talking about some of the interesting questions that are raised by this game, uh, and thinking a little bit more about history and academics and um, uh, historical research and scholarship being applied and used in, uh, in uh, serious games and, and video gaming. Um, just really quickly, kind of, I just kind of standard disclaimer since I'm here representing the game, that it's developed um, with a variety of uh, partners and funding uh, in the Czech Republic, uh, including Charles University in Prague, um, Department of Math Phys, New Media Department as well, the Academy of Sciences of the Czech Republic, and several of its uh, research institutes, um, and then finally the Ministry of Culture of the Czech Republic. So we've been very fortunate uh, to have this backing without, without which this game would have I think never, never been possible. <clears throat> so I want to begin with a thought experiment, um, maybe a bit heady and maybe a little bit morose uh, to bring to, up in a conference in this particular environment, but um, it's the type of thought experiment that I like conducting with uh, my students uh, when, I, when I'm teaching. Um, and two questions that I would ask, and the first one is, uh, what would you risk? And what do I mean by this? I mean that if, if we think about... Um, 
uh, war and conflict. Um, and I think um, uh, the game, uh, This War of Mine, which was recently released, uh, does a really good job raising these types of questions. Um, in a time of war and conflict, um, uh, for example, World War II, uh, there were a lot of situations that people were placed in in which they had to make choices uh, that were in many ways choiceless. There really was no good choice to make. Uh, so, for example, um, if you killed a German military officer or a member of the Nazi party in an occupied territory uh, in Europe during World War II, the German military policy officially was to kill 100 civilians for every one German soldier that was killed by a civilian. Okay? Um, if you were caught hiding someone who was Jewish, if you were caught, the retaliation was your entire family would be killed, would be murdered. That was the response. So the question then is, what would you risk? Would you be willing, as a human, to risk your family, your partner, your friends, to save a stranger? Would you be willing to risk your family to save your best friend? These are the types of questions that people face in life outside of this room uh, in a very real, tangible way. And I think oftentimes it's easy for many of us who are fortunate enough, it's easy for us to forget it. Uh, the second question is, who can you trust? Another powerful question. Um, and, and for this question, I, I'm always, I was reminded of uh, the Pulitzer, Pulitzer Prize uh, winning book Mouse by Art Spiegelman, famous graphic novel about World War II and the Holocaust. In the very beginning of the book, um, Vladek Spiegelman, who is a Holocaust survivor, is talking to his son. His son is young, did not grow up in Germany, grew up in the United States, grew up actually in, in Queens, uh, close to where I teach. Um, and the son is upset because his friends are picking on him. And the father, who is a Holocaust res survivor, responds, Friends, your friends, if you lock them together in a room with no food or water, then you see what it is, friends. Right? And again, this is just, wow. That's, first of all, not good parenting, in my opinion. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> um, but, uh, but certainly, right, again, the type of question that maybe we don't ask ourselves very often, uh, being the trusting people that we are. Um, and we'll come back to this, and there's a reason why I raise uh, these questions and these issues, because they relate in many ways very directly uh, to this game. They're kind of academic questions. They're historical, historically grounded questions that we are trying to apply uh, in, in a game. Getting people to think about these issues in real and tangible ways, as, as history should. Um, so just a brief, very, very brief overview. Uh, the game, uh, Czechoslovakia, 3889. Um, covers this particular episode. It's episodic. This is the first episode of three that will be released in just a couple of months. The game in the other room is a prototype. There's some bugs. Um, it covers the period uh, in Czechoslovak history, Czechoslovakia, small country in the central of Europe. I'll mention it again in a minute. Um, occupied during World War II, um, and very famously in 1942, I believe it is, um, terrible historian that I am, um, the uh, protector or the kind of Nazi military commandant of these occupied territories, a guy by the name of Reinhard Heydrich, was very famously assassinated by uh, Czech paratroopers. Um, and uh, players are dropped into the middle of this game shortly after the assassination of Reinhard Heydrich. Incidentally, was one of the architects of the Holocaust. Um, and players are presented with different responses to the assassination of Heydrich in the game. Okay? Um, and uh, you see the retributions for the killing of Heydrich, which include the annihilation of two Czech villages. Thousands of people were killed in response to the assassination of this German mil military leader. Um, now, amid this repression, the protagonist of the story is not actually living through these events. It's a grandchild of people who did. And you are helping your grandmother move, and as you do, you are pulling up objects from her past, and you're asking her questions about them through a series of interviews and conversations, and the game kind of evolves and develops from there. Okay? Um, and you're trying to figure out what role does your grandfather play in the attack, why didn't he tell his family about the, what he did, uh, was he a brave man for helping this attack against Heydrich, or was he reckless because he endangered the life of his family, and he indirectly caused the murder of thousands of people, innocent people, okay? Is he a resistance fighter? Is he a hero? Um, or was he reckless, dangerous, dumb, trying to be a hot shot, a big shot? Um, so let me just really quickly, uh, I don't want to give myself too little time, 
But I'm going to quickly show a clip of the of the game. I had it embedded here, but for whatever reason, it's uh, the the audio is not playing on the uh, on the clip. So let me just quickly show you here. Uh, so this is the trailer of the game. Notice our ambiguous language of around 2015, as any, uh, anyone who's developed something like this knows these dates can be a bit <laughs> flexible. Um, so uh, let me move this forward. It seems to be a little slow. Um, no, that's the clip. It didn't work. And here we go. Good. So let me talk a little bit about some of the educational outcomes of the game. And I will... Can you hear that? Is that me? <laughs> oh, it is. YouTube, YouTube does that now. It sort of carries you forward. Um, okay, uh, so educational outcomes of the game, and I'll just very quickly talk about this, and this is a little bit more where my involvement as project advisor has come in. Um, first is to present key historical events in 20th century uh, European history through the lens of Czechoslovakia. Uh, some of you might be asking why Czechoslovakia, right? It's a small state at the heart of Europe, um, in the words of uh, British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain, ab about which we know nothing. Right. This is not a place that many people know much about. Maybe you know a bit about Prague, fun place to drink, um, etc. Um, but I, I would argue uh, that Prague and Czechoslovakia, modern-day Czech Republic, actually offer a perfect vantage point for understanding European history. This was a, a territory that was a part of a multinational empire. Um, it had a short-lived democracy that was crushed by the Nazis during World War II. And then after World War II, it becomes a communist dictatorship. Uh, that uh, does not fall until 1989, right? Very, uh, some of you, many of you probably know. And today it's struggling with many of the legacies uh, of, of communism and, and other issues that European states are struggling with, ultra-nationalism, political corruption, and of course the forces of globalization. So I think this is a, a wonderful kind of case study for larger phenomena. Uh, second is that it enables the audience to experience these events from the perspective of different actors. And this is where I think um, the game is especially interesting. Okay? This is really, in many ways, the key to critical thinking, particularly in learning and in education, um, forcing your audience to confront viewpoints that are different than their own. Okay? Um, and how we confront and integrate these conflicting viewpoints is really a key to what education is about. It's not about memorizing facts and kind of spitting back. It's about you integrating these conflicting uh, viewpoints and opinions. Um, uh, and so it allows us then this kind of deeper, multifaceted understanding of historical events. And that's what we really try to get at in the game. And I'll, I'll come back to that at the end. Um, next is to create an active learning experience. Any pedagogue would know that this is extremely important, that students and us, we are not passive learners. We're not sponges. You don't just sit there, empty vessels, and I fill you with information, and then you walk out. Right? Um, active learning is about you structure an environment in which students then take knowledge of their own free will and put it together. 
So you structure an environment in which people sort of integrate things, organize things, and then present it as their own. So the idea of a game in which you, the player, has control, you get to choose who you talk to. You get to choose the types of questions that you ask people that you meet. Um, one of my favorite encounters in the game, there's this guy who was accused of collaborating with the Nazis. And you can begin the conversation by saying, I would really love to ask you some questions about the war. Or you could say, I hear you collaborated with the Gestapo. Is that true? Are you a Nazi? Like something to that effect. And of course, if you take the latter option, the guy will immediately be like, ah, piss off. You know, and he closes his door and that's the end of it, right? Um, so you actually have this opportunity to kind of um, think about how would you engage a topic like that? How would you address it? How would you, you talk about it? Um, so in some then, uh, history is open to questions and interpretation, and the goal of this game is to, to get students, and hopefully not just students, um, uh, participating in that. So um, in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to just, I'm going to kind of skip through this. This is more of an overview of the game and how it is. I would just say it is a single player adventure game, very, very loosely, I would say, similar to Telltale's Walking Dead, but I, I would not want to put this game on that, on that level. I, I, I personally, at least the first season of that, I admire deeply as a game. But that's sort of what it is. It has mixed media elements. You see these real-time interviews that are video clips, and then there are the kind of, as you saw from the introductory clip, there are these kind of animated sequences that are sort of like a game world where you click on different things and you interact with the environment. You have different tasks that you have to accomplish. So with the couple of minutes I have left, I think what, what I, what I want to really talk about, um, get to some of the different artwork for the game, which I, I personally like quite a lot, just a couple of the larger issues I would like to talk about here that the game touches upon, and I think maybe that's why I'm here. And the first is this issue of history and authenticity. Okay? Now, while this game is based on oral history interviews with individuals who lived through the depicted historical events, this is not actually oral history. That woman that you see is actually, she's performing a script. Okay? This is a constructed story with authentic details. Now, that might be problematic for some people or for some historians because you're presenting accounts as if they're actual and they're authentic. Um, and this is actually an opaque filter. This is, in a sense, we are narrativizing something and presenting it as if it is this sort of oral history I'm asking you about the past. Um, and I would say that um, the game is very cautious in the historical liberties that it takes. It does not present viewpoints or ideas that have not been articulated in some fashion by people. And again, this is where, in my opinion, having historians or scholars working on a project is very useful. We are the people who are going into the archives and digging these narratives and stories out. So when the game designers are looking to craft stories and interactions, they have us there to bounce ideas off of to help keep them on track and to not gamify things uh, too much. Um, so... On this point of gamifying emotionally and ethically loaded issues, um, I, my opinion is, is this is not something that the game does precisely because of the involvement of uh, these different uh, um, uh, institutions. Last point here that I'll focus on before I end, because I'm, I'm at the end, is this idea of multi-perspectivity with diverse and marginalized voices. And I, I already touched upon this a little bit in terms of competing viewpoints. One of my favorite sequences in the game, you get to talk to this guy who collaborated with the Nazis. And in a sensitive way, you ask him why. And the guy begins to talk about, well, look, we assassinate one guy, and in response, thousands of innocent people are killed. How is that worth it? It's reckless. It's stupid. That's not the type of viewpoint you would get in a standard history textbook. A standard history, history textbook would say, here are the heroes that resisted the Nazis during World War II and, and did this great act of killing the architect of the Holocaust. Right? It was a good thing to kill this guy. But many people in the moment were, thought it was a terrible idea. Right? Um, so that's just one example of multiple perspectives. Another, and this is very deeply controversial in the European and Czech in particular context, is that one of the lead characters in this episode of the game is Roma. She is, in other words, a gypsy, I think is the standard parlance, um, perhaps not politically correct in English. Um, and many people might not know, but 
there were anywhere from a quarter million to more than one million Roma that were killed during the Holocaust as well, and along with Jews, they were targeted as an ethnic group for extermination. Now, there still is a lot of prejudice and racism against Roma today, all over Europe. They are expelled. They were, there were thousands were just recently expelled from France, for example. Um, one of the heroes in this game is Roma. She is the person who helps rescue your grandfather from a concentration camp at the end of the war. Her perspective is treated very sensitively. She's also a woman. Um, and this is actually very deeply co controversial in the Czech context. A lot of people are very upset about this. Um, and uh, the game designers have caught some flack for this in the media of trying to heroize a Roma and talk about her suffering. You know, it's more politically correct garbage. Why are we talking about this kind of thing? Um, so I think that, again, a game like this can really bring these perspectives in in a very interesting way that's not necessarily forceful, that forces people to understand things from perspectives and to give a voice to those who are marginalized in a way that, on the surface, kind of seems fun in entertaining. I think this is my last comment, is that it would remind me as in the United States as if there was a game developed that was incorporating black slaves or Native American viewpoints uh, into historical accounts. And I, this is something that I think is still sorely lacking in the American, uh, particularly gaming uh, context. Um, think of Andrew Jackson, for example, who's still on our $20 bill, who directly defied a Supreme Court ruling to ethnically cleanse the Cherokee from their land, sent them on death marches. Uh, this is still a topic that's deeply controversial for us to discuss today, right, nearly 200 years later. So my hope would be, in conclusion, uh, is that this game, while a different national context, can maybe help people to think about moving forward how we ourselves, in our particular national context, can think a bit about addressing these issues and legacies through serious gaming. So, sorry for that. That, all three were just wonderful. Thank you all so much. Uh, I mean, I've been thrilled to be a part of this from the beginning and see it all come together. And that's just the highlight of the weekend, probably, for me. So thank you. Uh, questions? We have about 15 minutes, a little over, so we can get some in. That's not bad. No, it's great. Yeah? Um, yeah, I guess this is for any analyst. Um, but I, I'd like to know your thoughts on um, art museums picking up video games as fine art objects. Um, and whether, or I guess what that means for video games or for pieces that use um, video games as activism um, to join this like art industrial complex. Should we collect a few questions first or Let's just go, we'll respond go, directly? Yeah, we'll respond, but this one is for all three, I would say, so maybe we'll just go uh, closest to me that way. <laughs> um, actually, both of these have been screened to galleries um, and are available online, but it makes a really Interest, it creates an interesting question around like who are they making this for? What's really the primary act? Was it about doing that in the moment, or is it really for us to watch after and then judge these gamers and how they react? So it, it really complicates what the performance act is, um, and they've been shown in like galleries all over the world in different contexts. Um, yeah, so I think it's it's a good question and. I think it changes um, maybe questions of why they're doing it. I mean, even Frank Matthews have, have become very famous by doing art hoaxes and things like that that critique that kind of system, but then they're using their own, they're creating their own objects that are used within that system as well. So it's kind of all that. Um, <clears throat> this reminds me of, uh, well, just uh, thinking about the Illuminator in our work and how that's not going to be like subsumed by museums necessarily anytime soon. We were just recently arrested for projecting onto the Metropolitan Museum of Art. <laughs> so I think that, that, that what we do, like, we kind of like define, we're sort of like intentionally not trying to integrate in that way. And I also like, I see uh, a lot of problems with the way that it does get integrated. Like, uh, for example, at the, at MoMA, they had this huge, maybe it's still there, but they had this huge like video game installation. And I went there one day, and literally 40% of the games were broken. They weren't working. Mm. And then, like that, to mm -hmm. me, seemed to speak to this like problem, which is like fine mm. art is like trying to take ownership of this new like mm -hmm. arts practice of game-based creativity, when really that's not how it's it's not born from within the fine arts community. It's born from somewhere else. And they're trying to say like, oh no, like this is ours now because like we're the art world. 
And so, like, I think there's some conflict there. I'd like to see, like, a little bit more push from the other side, maybe. But it's also a question of interactivity, isn't it? And I think mm -hmm. the museums also recognize that that's something that they really need to start developing as a way of drawing people in, right? Yeah. And, and, these, and these, these, these sort of interactive media experiences are a way to it. But I think you're absolutely right. I mean, then how they handle it and the whole thing can become so stultified and, and formal that, yeah, you walk in and half of it doesn't work, right? Um, but yeah, no, I think maybe taking it from that perspective, absolutely, it's something that museums themselves recognize to greater or lesser extents that they need to do. I was involved last year in the Wolfsonian Museum in Miami and organizing an ideas festival um, it was exactly trying to kind of think of ways to do this sort of thing, create more interactive exhibition pieces. Um, so hopefully it's something that they, they figure out. Um, uh, certainly I don't, I, I don't see too much of it myself. Other questions? Sure. Um, one thing I noticed with all three of the youth is that you're dealing with games at the intersection of something else, of arts, of funding for public defenders, <laughs> legal system, of history. And so I'm wondering where you see the potential for games to be part of broader social justice movements. Like where are the best what are the best uses for games for us to affect social change throughout society and not just within the game context? I love this. This is like becoming a workshop where all three of you are now co presenters. <laughs> <laughs> well, not everyone has to give a question to all three, but I certainly enjoy this. I mean, anyone want to start? Same. Yeah, same, same sure. process. Okay. Um, sure. Well, I mean, I'm mostly looking at people intervening in games that already exist. Of course, I think making games is sort of the obvious direction um, to discuss. But I think actually going into these spaces that seem so aggressive um, and kind of like mo monocultures, right? And going in and breaking those and asking questions within them and really bringing social critique to these platforms that are used by millions and millions of people and kind of trying to break that a bit and to insert yourself into those spaces, yeah. Um, I, uh, I'm still trying to kind of figure that out myself. Um, I was recently asked at an interview for a faculty position, like, do you really think that, like, gaming can do anything? Can it, like, impact the world? I was like, I think so. Like, <laughs> I sure hope so. Um, I'm really into Ian Bogus' idea of procedural rhetoric. It's something I've been thinking about recently a lot. It's, like, the idea that by, like, like a video game, you know, it's systemic, it's procedural, and that it's, like, executing code. And so you can kind of, like, emulate systems. And by, like, seeing the way a system works in that way, you can mount political or any type of argument within that context. And I think that that is something that I, I champion. I'd like to see a little more of yeah. it. Hmm. I'm still trying to figure out how I want to respond to this. Um, it's, you, know, so I, you know, I mean, to me, to some degree, a video game is really, someone could correct me on this if I'm, if I'm, not, I'm not, not right in making this assumption, but I mean, you know, it's, it's a medium, right? And so, I mean, the, the, so I was thinking to myself, well, I mean, it's sort of like asking what potential does a book have to be revolutionary? Right. Well, sure. Yeah, there's definitely potential. Like, of course, like with perhaps with any medium now, of course, how things are articulated, um, the medium itself can shape that, like to some degree, right? The form can shape the content, right? And, and so then the question becomes, in what ways does this particular medium shape the content in such a way that it would be more or less conducive to kind of serving the ends of social justice or making kind of some sort of critical intervention? And I think it's precisely going back to my, my earlier point about the, about the active learning experience, about the opportunity of, of kind of you, it's not, you know, the revolution could have been televised and it wouldn't have mattered because we just would have sat and watched it, really. Um, whereas a video game is, you are still more invested. There's more going on into a video game, like, which I think your presentation really illuminates, right? You're acting into it. And other people are acting into it as well. So there's so much more there at stake. So in that regard, I would say there's a great amount of potential. I don't know if that answers your question. I should let other people Yeah, maybe we'll let these people So I saw some hands earlier, so we'll go one, two, three. OK. Um, my question uh, is for uh, you specifically, Kimberly. Uh, and my, I'm a little bit reticent to ask, but I feel like my uh, reveal myself to be an uncultured uh, reactionary chocolate light or something. But um, I found myself being really irritated 
by the uh, the projects you covered, um, despite having you know uh, political sympathy for for their aims. I'm I'm left wondering, you know, getting back to the question of like of who it's for, who space it's for, and how it's, uh, how they go about it. You know, it's you know they have these uh, what the performative interventions, I think you called it, in these you know very very ephemeral spaces, and then perhaps it's put on display somewhere else. Uh, that just le that leaves me wondering, um, you know, if they're disrupting the space like that in such an ephemeral fashion, a space that everyone else is kind of like bought into, like, you know, this, this magic circle, everyone's agreed to, you know, play a game which requires that you have a prescribed space. That, what I saw just struck me as nothing more than trolling, but worse because it's sanctimonious. Um, and I was wondering, not to put position you as the no, apologist, <laughs> as the apologist for these works, but if you could offer some No, I think that's, I think that's a totally valid critique and one that I was trying to point at at the end, but don't have a ton of time to go into, but that they really become sort of like the artist's center. And um, with the videos, um, I didn't really talk about how they've been shown in galleries, but they, they're also very edited. So I have no right. sense of how long um, Freedom was done, um, but it's like a 10 to 15 minute video where presumably she went on for a really long period of time and just took the ones that are really exciting or make the gamers look really bad, mm -hmm. look really aggressive. Mm -hmm. So it's a choice, mm -hmm. um, but I think we should question that choice. Mm -hmm. um, and the same with Delap, like he did years of it and has talked about um, some of the other times that he didn't even record. So he has two one longer recording and one shorter one, but he really selected those too. So he put in, you know, times where he's being called a terrorist and all these things. So he's, again, making these gamers look like they're really aggressive um, and really dismissive of his project. Um, and it situates him as better, for sure. And I think that's something definitely to look into. Um, like, what kind of conversations are they trying to bring to the table there? And what is that closing off? I think that's, yeah, I, I really agree as well. I think they open up a lot, but they also, the way they go about it closes a lot too, yeah. Follow-up question, can you what is art? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, like, I had a question in, in this similar vein about, about, about trolling and subversive action within game ecosystems, and to, like, to what extent, like, yeah, like, where, where does the line come in between, like, the yeah, definition of, like, I don't know, playing a game the way it's not supposed to be played if you're doing it for, for the lulls or if you're doing it for, <laughs> like, a, a larger, like, political aim or just, like, disrupt the system. I, I don't know. I, mean, I was wondering if you could speak to something with that continuum. Because I, I was just thinking, like, comment, like, all right, what are the games that I play? How could I play within those systems uh, and, like, play the way I'm not, I'm not supposed to and get people to think outside of it and then, like, think about how that's going to be perceived. And then it's just like, oh, is that just, like... Old year old trying to get attention by doing something different. Uh, like, I guess, could you speak to like how you can make a like meaningful political or artistic statement uh, inside of a, a game context? I think it's it's it going to at the end of the day be really object objective. Like, whether you think it's effective. I mean, mm -hmm. there's maybe less um, really aggressive oppositional examples. So there's like Velvet Strike, which is an older example mm -hmm. where people did um, like just tag spray painting. Um, anti-war slogans, um, and then they would they would stay in the game. Mm -hmm. So that's like a little less aggressive because you're not going after individual players. You're just changing the atmosphere of the game a bit mm -hmm. and adding something a layer to it. Right. So that would be maybe another way of going about it. Um, I think it total like there's an infinite number of ways that you could go into these games and mm -hmm. shake them up. These are super um, oppositional. Mm -hmm approaches yeah. and I think that turns a lot of people off so um, I'm really interested actually in in how to do interventionist art and not be overly oppositional like the idea of social art that isn't purely against others right. um, so yeah. are there any examples of that I, I haven't about, found any examples of like people playing the game like well and politically yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay. I haven't come across it but I'd be super interested <laughs> How do you respond to those who may feel that you're misappropriating their experience or their medium? So for example, if your definition of a game is mindless entertainment, a World War II survivor might find the Czechoslovakia game 
to be exploitative or trivializing of their experience. You mentioned that you've been arrested for showing your art, and gamers in Counter-Strike might find that those artists are getting in the way of how the game is supposed to be played. It's not why they're there. So how do you respond to those critics who have a vested interest in these experiences, and then gamers came along and decided to make something else out of it? Let me get my response out of the way real quick, because it's a different angle, I think, than the two of you would come at this from, because mine, in some ways, is official art, um, and, and I think and what you're doing is not. Um, to me, the, the issue with this game is a little bit more, again, back to this question of the medium. And, it, you know, the same thing happened in the early to mid-1980s when Art Spiegelman released Mouse, and there were a lot of people who felt, well, how on earth could you create a comic book about the Holocaust. Um, but what was surprising about it is how non-offensive, actually, it ended up being to many people and how much less controversial it was. And so far, the response that we've seen among people who are survivors, it's been exactly that, interestingly. <laughs> um, there's not a sense that it's trivialized. And I think that's more a, a generational reflection. A game like this probably wouldn't have been made 30 years ago. Or if it would have been, it would have just been you storming Normandy shooting at people. Right? It wouldn't have been games like that were made 30 years ago. But dealing with the serious consequences of war and conflict the way we see in a game like this, or a game like this war of mine, uh, is I think a little bit more recent. And I think it's a product of a growing maturity in understanding what games are and what they can do. So to some degree, I think the ground has already been laid. But um, I guess I'd bump up against that most as someone that's trying to make a living, like not as an academic and an artist or something, and like applying for money and, and like shows and having it be like, oh, this is a, a gaming uh, exhibition or something. And like, you know, I submitted NSA Haiku to that at one point, this thing in Toronto actually. And they're like, we love this, but it's categorically not a game. And being, oh shit, you're right, okay. Um, and then like, sort of just trying to decide like which like, like spot I should sort of situate myself in, like artist, game maker, whatever. Um, but then to speak to, uh, the thing about being arrested is like I guess I just the way I deal with that is I sort of view the like law as another creative context to play within and now it's like <laughs> we're like we have like a lawyer he's like a first <laughs> amendment attorney and they're like we're you know interacting with the police in this really interesting way so that to me is like the next sort of phase in this kind of game or whatever <laughs> the next level the next level you're at the boss <laughs> level <laughs> yeah. last level is the supreme court <laughs> like, global revolution <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I, like they're trying to upset people. Like, uh, it's meant to shake things up and kind of it. It really, I mean, it's online, but it is just like protest in public space, right? So it's meant to shake people up. It's meant to be out of the norm, um, just for a brief moment, though, right? So there is the argument that you know, protest might shut down a street, but it is temporary, um, and then you can go back to whatever. But it's just to shake you up make you think differently, rerouted a bit, so. Thank you. All right, it sounds like you're saying art is socially transgressive and potentially legally transgressive, or as well, it's doubly transgressive. <laughs> uh, we have time for maybe one, two more questions. Meaning of life, you guys can both be I can follow through. So, I actually am a law student, and know the folks at NICLU that work with, like, group people, and so that, that's, where I'm focusing when I say, like, what is the potential for games? Because I've done, there are like thousands and thousands of pages written on every other medium as it relates to implicit bias and how we can shape legislative debate, but like nothing written on games. Like, I figured this out this week. Like, I started learning about this on Sunday and then, like, came to this today. So, in that context, where, like, you have a lawyer now, what, what are his thoughts? How, how can you use this for broader societal impact? Or within existing community groups, like those kind of activist networks. Uh, yeah, I mean that's that's a difficult question. Um, I think for one, it's for for our lawyer, it's about trying to like gradually get the NYPD and its like new commissioner to understand that like you can't just like you know arrest first, ask questions later all the time, and like it's a shame because like when they do make that mistake, they don't they don't really have to pay for it. It's like like, if you, for example, sue the NYPD, you're not suing the police department, you're suing the state of New York. And so that money just comes from all of us. Um, and so I guess, like, one of the hopeful outcomes is that we get 
legislation on the books, like you, like you know, and we're we have a precedent that like protects us and other artists from doing, uh, from getting arrested for doing this kind of thing. Mm. That also raises a really interesting issue of politics, and uh, especially with the the game project I'm involved in, because I mean most of the funding is coming from the state, right? Um, and again, that's a very European thing, right? To have these kind of large state, have a ministry of. Can you imagine the United States have a ministry of culture? Like it's kind of like okay, it's fair. called Sony, right? I mean, um, <laughs> it's. I mean, so you know, so that in itself is interesting, and that actually becomes a part of going back to this other question earlier about games being, you know, being offensive or kind of like causing this sort of issue. That's where some of this anger about you know Roma and minorities comes in. Is that now it's a question of state funds, public money being used to support a project that is furthering things about quote unquote minorities. And then, right, and then it becomes, right, then it becomes a politicized issue, right? And this is one of the problems with, I've had arguments with my European friends about this all the time, usually more are artists, who again, receive a lot of money. I mean, nine out of the 10 grants they apply to are from state governments or the EU. And I've said time and time again, I mean, doesn't that that puts you in a weird sort of bind. I mean, you're rejecting them, you're resisting them, you're attacking their institutions, yet you're also using their money to do it. And you're discrediting the institution, you're angering the public, you're isolating and alienating yourselves, and you're potentially undermining the ability of these institutions in the future to continue that funding. Because you're just pissing people off, right? And they're just gonna wanna cut it. They're gonna vote for politicians who argue to get rid of it. And I see that as a real problem, absolutely. Um, but I do side with the people who make other people angry, usually. <laughs> Let's one last quick. Question. It's quick, great. Yeah. Um, what do you guys think is a, a, a good mainstream video game in the last five years that you guys think is, would you guys would consider art or gets close to being art? <laughs> That's a really hard question. <laughs> Not even the Walking Dead. <laughs> I don't know. I don't really. I'm not really like a mainstream gamer. Um, most of the, the really great games that I've played recently have been. I saw that Baby Castles. I don't know if anyone's been there. The after party's there tonight. Hmm. Uh, and I think, like, and in these types of spaces, that's kind of more what I'm interested in. Like, really radical, not just politically and socially, but like in terms of the formal aspects. That's my kind of my, my jam these days. So I'd say uh, Hyper Particle Mace mm -hmm. and um, Realistic Kissing Simulator. If anyone's played that? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. I, I don't know if I could venture to say, I mean, because then we're back to that question that you asked jokingly about what is art, yeah. right? Um, and that's a joke anymore. Yeah, huh? and that's just, suddenly, suddenly it's not funny to me. Um, and I mean, maybe I'll just say, like, maybe answer a, quest, the question, a question you didn't ask, which is a typical way to get out of these things, is, I mean, a, a game that I would really recommend that I've mentioned a couple times, not as art, but maybe more as social commentary or kind of thoughtful reflection, but is also entertaining and fun. And through the process of playing, it teaches you something. And again, that would be this war of mine, which I've, I've already mentioned. And if you haven't tried it, I would, I would highly recommend it. I would also recommend, you know, writing a blog or a diary along with it as you go, like as if it's part of your own experience. And so for me, it's transformative, so I think that maybe I'd call art. I don't know. Yeah, I think it's a question of what is art. <laughs> um, but I, in terms of political games, I'm mostly interested in like Mole Industria and that kind of like same like alternative gaming. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know what kind of mainstream one I would call art in that way. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, the conversation doesn't end here, even though we have to leave the room. Uh, please talk to any of us or each other and keep this going on. Thank you. Thank you. That was great, guys. Yeah, like what? That's awesome. You, um, you're based in, in Czech, huh? Uh, no, I'm here. Um, I live in East Village. Um, so I, I go out there a couple times a year. And uh, mostly work with them. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's a lot of, like, there's a lot of stuff in the game. Uh, 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 How about you? You're here? Uh, yeah. Okay.
Some of those uh, sites I was jotting them down as you were showing them, it's hilarious. So, that's really funny. It's really I love the generator. Yeah. Hi there. Hi, how are you? Oh, thanks for having Yeah, it's a time. It's a time soon. I mean, I think the time is going on right now. Yeah, you can see the transit. It's so fun. I like all the time. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was like, that's great. Yeah, that would be awesome. 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 I did. I did. I did. Uh, like, Sweet. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, yeah. let's do that. And I'll, I'll send you uh, an email. Yeah. 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 Thank you as well. Yeah, absolutely.